grace and peace to you from God our Father and from his Son, Jesus the Christ. Our text is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. There was a little four-year-old boy named Billy. He and his grandmother were sitting up front of the church. They wanted to get a good view of little Billy's baby brother being baptized. And Billy was so attentive. After the pastor had read quite a bit out of this big book, he put his hand into the baptismal font. And Billy asked his grandmother, Granny, what, what's he doing? He says, well, he's putting water on his, on, on his hand, and he's going to put some on your uh, brother's head. Is it going to hurt him? No, it's not going to hurt him. Well, when he finished doing that, he, the pastor opened a little vial and put his finger in there. Again, Billy asked Granny, what's he doing? She said, well, he's putting some oil on his finger, and he's going to put it on your brother's head. Is that going to hurt? No, it's not going to hurt. Him. But when the pastor lit that baptismal candle and walked towards his brother, little Billy let out a shout, that's going to hurt. Well, what the little fella said has a great deal of truth with it. With all the gifts of baptism also comes our scriptural call to let our light so shine before others that they may see our good deeds and glorify our Heavenly Father. Well, letting your light shine can and will at times hurt. It hurt Jesus. It took his life. It began with his baptism. Every year on the first Sunday following Epiphany, Epiphany, January 6th, three days ago, we celebrated the arrival of the wise men in Bethlehem to worship the newborn king. That was what we call an Epiphany, an appearance of God. Well, Jesus' baptism is recorded in all four of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So to remind ourselves of what Jesus' baptism meant for him, and it means to us, we're going to be using those few verses from the gospel according to Luke. Now, you know, when you have a number of witnesses, and there's four different gospels uh, that have, all four of the gospels have an account of Jesus' baptism, the various writers are going to emphasize what, what stands out to them as most significant. And we'll see an, a good incident of that in a few moments. But the, the best part of having multiple witnesses is that we get a much more complete account. Well, in, in verses prior to our text, Luke had been describing John the Baptist ministry. Now, John's role, as you'll remember from the Advent sermons, and, of course, from our Lenten sermons. John's role was to prepare for the arrival of the Messiah, or Christ. Let me remind you. Messiah is from the Hebrew. It means anointed. Christ comes from the Latin, which means anointed. So we use them interchangeably when we're speaking about Jesus Christ, the Messiah, or Jesus the Christ. All right. John's role is to prepare people for this long-awaited Messiah. You see, hundreds of years before, God, speaking through the prophets, promised the people of Israel that he would send them a great Savior. Now, over those years, the people came to expect and want a very powerful king like David, an earthly, an earthly general, fighter that would unite the people of Israel, make them a powerful nation again so that they could drive out the Romans, they would be free from slavery to the Romans. But that's not the kind of Savior that God had promised 
or that he sent. He sent his son to save them from sin and death and to give them that new life that he wants them to have here on this earth and for all eternity. Now, in preparing for the arrival of the Messiah, John the Baptist called the people to a baptism of repentance from sin. Now, we know repentance means 180 degree turn away from what we've been doing. But it's important to remember that there's three main ingredients in repentance. First, it's admitting, confessing to God that we've sinned, enumerating it. And this, the second is to ask God for forgiveness. And the third is to take some action to turn away from that way of speaking or acting or, or thinking. Now, as a sign of their inward change of heart and their commitment to following God's way of living, people were baptized. The baptism was a symbolic washing away of sin. But what was happening of importance and value was on the inside. Well, that brings the question, why? Why in the world did Jesus come to be baptized? He did not need forgiveness. We know from the scriptures that he never sinned. As a matter of fact, John the Baptist tried to talk him out of it. We run over to Matthew's gospel. We read, but John tried to deter him, Jesus. I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so for now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Indeed, Jesus never sinned, but he submitted himself to being baptized in order to continue his earthly life, doing all, everything that a faithful, God-loving, and faithful, God-obeying person would do. A life that no other individual had lived before him and has ever lived that way since. Well, Luke writes in our brief text, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. Now, I want to point out that Luke is the only gospel writer that mentions that Jesus was praying when the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form as a dove. It wasn't just an inspiration. It wasn't just an idea. No, this, he's in physical form, bodily form. Well, Jesus is recorded often praying in all four of the Gospels, but Luke the most. And Luke especially records Jesus praying at crucial points in his ministry or in his life. Well, Jesus' baptism was certainly a, 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 a crucial point. It marked the beginning of his public ministry. The Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form and empowered him. And as he's praying, as he's communicating with his heavenly Father, the Father speaks to him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Friends, Jesus' baptism is an epiphany. It's the appearance of the triune God. Anyone who tells you, well, the Trinity is not in the Bible. Well, the word Trinity is not, but the triune God is. There, we have Jesus, the Son of God. We have the Holy Spirit in bodily form. And we have the voice of God himself speaking. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And with the words, you are my son whom I love with you, I am well pleased. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth as the true Messiah, true man, true God. At his anointing, Jesus received the gift of the Holy Spirit to empower him as he began his public ministry. And he used that power for good. He used it to call men and women back to faith in God. Jesus preached like no other person has ever preached. Read the Sermon on the Mount. Read it. 
the best sermon ever preached. It changed the hearts and lives of many who heard it. And Jesus used the power of the Holy Spirit to heal people, to heal them physically, emotionally, and ultimately spiritually. Yet in doing so, <laughs> he met with and willingly endured rejection, humiliation, betrayal, desertion, scourging, and a torturous death on a Roman cross. He was tempted in every way, but he didn't waver. He never sinned. And it would be through his perfect life, his sacrificial death, and his resurrection from the dead that he would overcome sin and death for all who put their trust in him for forgiveness and eternal life. In Mark 16, 16, we read from Jesus this promise and this warning. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now, most of us here were baptized as infants. I mean, we had faith in us, but it hadn't been developed. Well, we were baptized into the faith of our parents and, and godparents or sponsors. They promised to raise us in the Christian church. They promised to bring us to church, to Sunday school. They promised to teach us the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, the Ten Commandments. They promised as we grew older to put into our hands the Scripture. And they constantly nourished our faith with prayer. When we reach a certain age, right now it's around 12, we go into a period of confirmation study. And after those two years of, of, of study of the Scripture and the uh, what we believe as Christians, we make our own public affirmation of faith. And, one of the, and we're asked three questions there. We're asked if, if we renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God. Do we renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? Do we renounce the ways of sin that draw us from God? You see, my friends, the word renounce means to cast out, to get rid of, not accept them, have nothing to do with, with these. That's the, the promise. That's the promise that we make as we are baptized. Now, and as adults, we're baptized. We, we, we undergo instruction. It might be a brief, more brief than the two years that our children went through. But we, as an adult, when we're baptized, we, we undergo uh, instruction that prepares us to make a public affirmation of our faith and do the same, make the same promises. Baptism is a gift. It comes through our faith in Jesus Christ. That faith will have to be developed if we're baptized as a child. If we're baptized later in life, it has to still be developed within us. But it's a great gift. And you know what? Faith is a gift also from God. We have the faith in us to believe or not believe. Baptism is a great gift for those who believe in Jesus Christ. I'll run down the list quickly. God forgives our sins. He rescues us from death. He grants us eternal life. God assures us that we are his children. He unites us with the church. We become brothers and sisters with Christians all over the world. One universal, one holy Catholic church. And together we have a great commission from Jesus Christ himself to share our faith. We call it the great commission. Jesus told us, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Well, how could he be with us if he's up in heaven? It, he's with us through the Holy Spirit. We have received that Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit in our baptism. Well, that's our mission statement as, as the church the Christian church. And we have a, a, a part to play in that. And we have a, 
daily marching order. And that's that scriptural commission that I read when we began. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Recall what that little boy yelled when he saw that candle approaching his, his little brother. He said, that's going to hurt. Well, at times it can. Brothers and sisters, if we're sincere in our faith, people who, who don't know Jesus, Christ. Maybe they drifted away from him or they've never really made a commitment to Jesus. They may see something in how we act, how we treat people, the language we use, how we treat them that's missing in their own life and, and they would like to have that. And the Holy Spirit can stir them to want to know more about Jesus and be drawn to faith in him. Yet living out our faith in today's world, in our nation now, in our community, and regrettably, even in some of our families. It can upset. It can even provoke people who want to hurt us. They may witness something in our Christian values, the lifestyle that we live, the ethics, the morality that we practice, even the language that we use or don't use the kindness we extend to people, maybe even the kindness we extend to them. And it convicts them of sin. But you know, that guilty conscience doesn't, doesn't always result in positive reaction. No, it can, it can lead them, it can compel them to see us as the problem and to ridicule discriminate, and even persecute. Of course, there's an easy way to avoid those negative reactions. We could simply put our light under a bowl, keep it to ourselves. Get in trouble that way. People don't know anything, don't know how. No, we're followers of Jesus Christ. There's nothing that shows it. Look, if we don't live differently than those who don't believe, then we fail as a follower of Jesus Christ. We fail him and we fail in our love for God and for our neighbor. Sin separates men and women from God. And the penalty for sin is death. Eternal separation from God. And my friends, that is hell. That is hell. Jesus said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. Friends, as long as we live in this fallen world with our sinful nature, at times we are going to stumble, we're going to fall, we're going to make mistakes, bad choices, that's sin. But we can, re we can and we need to renew our baptism. Now Martin Luther in his small catechism teaches us to renew our baptism daily. Not by getting dunked again or being sprinkled again, but by repentance. Which again starts with admitting where we're going wrong, where, what we've done wrong. Asking God for forgiveness and turning away from that kind of behavior. Over in Luke, I mean 1 John, we read, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just will, and will forgive us all our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now, Luther suggested to help us in this daily return to baptism that we should use the Ten Commandments as a mirror. Let me share something. I admit I've used this story before, but it's been a long time. I use this story that I remember from the time when I was a, a young Army recruit in basic training. It was a few years, about 60 years ago. Okay. After the first six weeks of basic training, we were able to have a overnight pass for the first time. And oh, how we look forward to that pass. But it wasn't automatic. Oh, we had to get the barracks looking spotless, and that would be inspected by the company commander. And then we would all have to line up outside the orderly room. That was 
the office of the first sergeant. And one by one, we would go in and we would be inspected. Our uniform, we, in those days, it was different than it is now. We had a Class A uniform. And it was summertime, so we didn't have jackets and so forth. We were in our khakis. He would look us over, and if there was anything wrong, he'd send us back. It might take a couple hours before he would look at us again. But you see, before we went for inspection, what we would do is we would look at ourselves in a full-length mirror that was in the barrack. Because around the perimeter of this mirror were a bunch of questions. Questions that read like, is your uniform clean? Crease is sharp. Insignia placed properly. Belt buckle shined. Tie straight. Shoes shined. And on and on the questions went, and the mirror passed judgment back to us. And let me tell you something, each one of us would always find something to change. You might say we did a lot of repenting before we would dare go before the first sergeant. Well, let me ask you, how would you and I do if we actually used the Ten Commandments as a mirror to our daily living? Ask questions like this. Have I put God first in my life, or am I chasing after the false gods of this world? Have I been worshiping regularly? Am I using God's name in vain? What about the rest of my language? Have I treated my parents with love and respect? What about those in authority over me? Like teachers, police officers. Have I hurt someone by my actions? Instead of doing what I, I can to help them. Have I been faithful to my spouse? Have I shown them love and respect? Have I been honest in my dealings with others? Have I been truthful in all circumstances? You get the point? Sure you do. But you might be thinking, well, that, that, that's going to take some time. I mean, we do that every day. And the, well, there, you, how about just two commandments? Huh? Remember when somebody asked Jesus, what was the greatest commandment? He replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Friends, I believe that if we honestly look at ourselves, how we've been living, we will see that we have not always loved our God. We haven't been loving our neighbor as ourselves. There's places there that, that need improvement. There's places that call for repentance. Look, we're never going to reach perfection in this life. It's not going to happen. No, not in this life. It won't happen. But we are baptized. We're forgiven. We have a new life in Jesus Christ. We have the power of the Holy Spirit within us. We're beloved children of God. And we have an eternal home that Jesus has gone to prepare for us. Martin Luther said that whenever he felt worthless, overwhelmed, or alone, he would shout, I am baptized. My friends, when the devil or one of his many accomplices was to make us feel worthless by reminding us of past mistakes, shortcomings, let us shout, I am baptized. When we find ourselves feeling overwhelmed, trying to work hard to do the right thing, let us shout, I am baptized. When the test comes back positive, we're not alone. Let us shout, I am baptized. No matter what this evil world throws at us, let us rejoice that this is not our final home and let us shout, I am baptized. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of baptism. Create in us a sense of urgency, the will and the courage to share our faith by what we say and do wherever we are and with whomever we encounter. May your Holy Spirit guide us, teach us, and empower us to be a light that leads others to you.
This we ask in your son's precious name. Amen.